your brain might just help you learn something in more ways than one. Welcome to Dr. Gary Bell's Absurd Psychology. Dr. Bell is a licensed marriage and family therapist. He'll be your guide on this crazy exploration designed to bring life back into our existence. Can you become the element of change in an ever-changing world? Possibly, but you've got to listen on to find out. Now here is the host of Absurd Psychology, Dr. Gary Bell. Hey everybody, welcome. Welcome to the show. Hey, listen, now today we're going to be talking about pre-marriage uh, before you sign the contract. And I got to tell you something, you know, premarital counseling statistically uh, lowers the chance of divorce, which is right around 65% in the United States, uh, to about 35%. And people that do it and do it seriously find they get to know each other enormously because a lot of people just spend their time planning their weddings, but they don't realize that they're making a real strong commitment that's going to cause for constant compromise, and they're actually developing two people into one, which is the body of marriage. And uh, so what's interesting is that navigation uh, especially if people try to get married early when they're in the honeymoon phase, they they got all those toxic, lovely chemicals going on, and they think it's always going to be that sexy, and then all of a sudden, they get married, and it's like, well, now that we're married, <laughs> let's see the rest of the picture. And so, it, you know, it's kind of interesting also in this day and age that we're in, uh, people are busy. Uh, younger people are getting married at a later date. Uh, abortions are down, which is a really good uh, statistic. But the other thing is uh, people are taking marriage a little bit more serious than they used to because they witnessed their parents' divorces. And it's amazing uh, how many people these days I see coming into counseling just for premarital counseling because they want to make sure that they're making all of the right choices and they don't want to go through it again, they don't want to go through the the cost of, of which the, the people that really pay the cost of divorce are the children. And uh, so people that have children, it just rips their life apart. No matter what you, how you know, lipstick on a pig, you, you, you just can't do anything nice about it. I mean, yeah, you can make good, but what they really want is they want their parents to be together because that's what brought them here. And uh, so interesting I really enjoy doing premarital counseling. I do a thing called Prepare and Enrich because it provides a test for both people that covers all the grounds that we're going to talk about today. And basically, they take that test, and once they submit it, it's sent to me. Then before they come into counseling, I've identified and able to, to know what the talking points are and the main differences in the people. Now, obviously, you're going to find other things. It's not all cut and dry, but you're able to have really lively discussions before they become arguments. And so that's what premarital counseling does. It makes for a much more peaceful alignment, a marriage, partnership, and it becomes a much more joyful because they, they start to understand each other a little bit better. So why do we do counseling? You know, you set your date, you bought the rings, you got your little outfits, you know, your, your tuxedo and your, your gown. Um, you book someplace that probably is really super nice. And you spent uh, so much time, money, and effort planning your ideal wedding. But, you know, you got to wonder how much energy do you put into planning your ideal marriage? You know, for many, it's a never-ending list of tasks. And, and it's uh, and all these things, get people get stressed out. And even the people that are participating in the wedding get stressed out because they have to do all this crazy stuff uh, that's required uh, of the marriage to be that perfect memory for that uh, lady or that man or both or whatever. Um, and it is a lifetime celebration, and there is a hope that it will be a lifetime. And so, yeah, you do want to make that event, you know, really special. But, you know, what's important is, is are you compatible? And that is the real concern. And so premarital counseling can be a really good way for you – and whoever you're with to prepare for the life and the family you're creating together. And by the way, I'm not talking just about a male and a female. I'm talking about male, male, female, female, trans, male, trans, female, whatever. You know, people are getting married across the board in all kinds of shapes and sizes. 
uh, I happen to come from a, a more Christian perspective, but I could care less if my clients or whatever, you know, you know, that's just their choice. And so the the deal is, um, I'm not going to uh, press my value system on anyone. I want to give them everything they need to to do well. Uh, but you know, studies really do reveal that premarital counseling is very effective. Uh, before you begin that married life. And it never hurts to do it, even if you didn't do it, do it after, because then you can begin that communication piece. Because as you get married, you tend to spend more time together and less time with other people, and you start to discover little things you don't like about each other, and they grow into big resentments. And so you don't want to go down that road if you can help it. You know, um, the, the, the good news about premarital counseling, it, it really establishes how to communicate in marriage, which is very different than how you communicate in life. And it also teaches uh, conflict management skills between you. And, and it also increases the, the quality of the relationship and the satisfaction of the relationship. Here I am talking now about it like a product, but you know the bottom line is, you, this this thing called marriage is one of the most important things you will ever do in your life if you take marriage serious. You know, couples who engage in premarital counseling usually get a more realistic picture of what marriage is and a deeper level of commitment to each other. And, and the other thing is it rips you away from the formula that you follow by looking at your parents. And that's the good news because quite frankly, in this day and age, it's very complicated to, to live. And the choices we have to make are not macro choices because we're not, you know, four channels on television. We're, we're dealing with social media. We're just dealing with all kinds of, I'm saying dealing, but it's integrated into our life, you know, Alexa, whatever, all this crazy stuff. The bottom line is, is that navigating marriage in this day and age is not like what your parents had to do. That was a little more primitive. These days, we have to be a little more sophisticated. And I'm not saying that some of the same tools aren't used, but we have to have a, a, a more adaptive uh, marriage for the culture that we're in, especially if you're going to raise kids. You know, uh, marriage and family therapists, educators, even clergy have different approaches to preparing couples that they work with for marriage. Like me, I, I quite frankly uh, have always used Prepare and Enrich, it's such a great program, and I'm not trying to advertise it because they, they make all the money, I don't, but it's, it's like 35 bucks to take the test, but it's so worth it, so worth it, and that's for both. Um, so what do you want to do? You know, in, in marriage communication, you know, why do we why do we do the counseling? Well, if we can improve, improve the communication and the conflict management skills, difficulty in communication may be the number one reason that people seek out marriage counseling. Often the strategies we naturally utilize to make our voices heard during conflict or the emotional intensity of our conversations can be counterproductive and even damaging. So premarital counseling provides you with specific skills you need to have to be more productive in conversations. For instance, uh, one of the most important uh, skills we can develop is understanding how to speak to each other in marriage. And that's like adults. You have to learn how to do conflict like adults, not parent to child, because all you're going to do is offend each other. If we do basic communication of just stating your emotions rather than demonstrating, you know, I'm really furious about or I'm very upset or, you know, I'm very disappointed that this happened. I'm, I'm just losing my mind over this problem. You know, th that means we're not using verbosity, we're not using our emotions, and we're doing conflict in a safe way. And that's what adults do. Unfortunately, most people in conflict do this dynamic of parent yelling at child, child going back to parent, and then yelling back at the person that, that tried to parent them as if they were a child. And then they both just basically get uh, very, very upset with each other and stop listening. Quite frankly, every conflict you will ever have in your life is a trust issue. If you can just identify what the trust issue is, then what happens is you can dissect and be constructive and create a solution and, and compromise because 
understanding what the, the trust issue is, you want to ask for faith. Let's develop a plan that we can have faith in. And sometimes that means you have to fake it till you make it and, and, and actually give that person an ingredient of trust, but not really trust them until you actually get the consistency to be able to trust them. Uh, I always say this, but you can love someone and not trust them. But when you trust someone, love will always follow. And so the binder for a, a marriage is trust. Every time you attack trust, you're attacking the marriage. You know, the people you trust, you could not see them for 10 years, and you click back together and your relationship just continues to grow. But people that you don't trust, you have a tendency to abbreviate your relationship with their life and start to prune it down to something that's functional. Many people sit quietly at a dinner table because they don't have anything to talk about that is safe. And that means they've they've got so many trust issues, either emotional, physical, or whatever, that they don't they have to go to safe topics just to get by. That's sad. That's when counseling can help. This other thing about premarital, it, you get a better understanding of values and differences. And, you know, how, how do you move forward when you discover your dream of a, a, a country life is at odds with your partner's desire for, for a big city? Or if you allow them to sneak up on you, your differences can feel threatening or impossible to reconcile. So they don't have to be, you know, our differences can enrich and enliven our relationships. And I often tell people, you know, get a life before you get married. Don't get married to get a life. Because you want to have a partner that is just as skilled at you in a different way where you both complement each other and are able to en en enhance each other's lives. So, so, you know, you want to have something to give before you go into an institution of marriage. Otherwise, there's going to be power struggles and resentment by the one who has to work and the other one who sits at home and uh, does all the work at home, which is really work. But the difference is that's an old leave it to beaver model that doesn't always necessarily work. It does if you have the right personalities and the right understanding and the right maturity, but uh, many people don't understand how difficult that is to pull off over the long term. And also, uh, you want to respect the fact that uh, you have an openness and an honesty with each other. People that trust each other can be honest and open and just discuss things on the fly. Uh, premarital counseling can help you and your partner develop skills you need to effectively uh, compromise and cooperate a as you build your life together. Also, you get to develop a better understanding of styles of communication. You know, what does she do when she's stressed? She, she needs space. When he's stressed, he needs to talk it out. That sounds actually, it's, it's usually more the woman needs to talk it out and the man uh, needs space, but uh, it could go either way. <laughs> you know, if she gives him space when he's stressed because that's what she would need, he may end up feeling resentful and alone, you know, uh, or if she gets left alone uh, because that's what he would do, that, you know, that's not good. And so they're setting the, the idea that I don't care about you, I don't love you because I'm not taking the time to process the way you need to process. The other, the other thing to, to really get from a, a 20,000 or 30,000 square feet um, is the idea that basically, you know, women – are going to take the temperature on a marriage uh, based on, uh, do you cherish me? And what that means is the woman is the center of your life. And if she doesn't feel like the center of your life, she's going to investigate. She's going to nag you. She's going to confront you. She's going to be moody and foul-tempered because she doesn't understand why she's not the center of your life. So what is cherish? Well, cherish means I... I I can't be the man I am without you. I don't even know why you're with me. I am so lucky to have you. Uh, I, you're my best friend. And it's that way when you're with her, and it's that way when you're not with her. And I'm not talking about some bubbly romantic thing. It's just the fact is that you honestly are humbled by the fact that you and this and your partner are together. And, and a man that keeps that is sexy and it's unfortunate but many men don't understand that they're too uh, egotistical to be able to put that ego down and put their wife in front of them as the center because if you do that and you have children 
now the kids are having a healthy model of what to see. Uh, the other thing is, what does a man need? Well, he needs to be heard. He needs respect. And that's the same word. You know, respect and listening are the same. If you don't feel heard, you're going to feel disrespected. And so the bottom line is men are demasculated when uh, they are not able to be heard. Um, it's important that a man is heard. It doesn't mean that he has to be uh, uh, agreed with, all it means is you validate. I understand. I hear what you're saying. Okay, so what you're telling me, you don't have to come up with your own conclusions. You know, and that's the other thing that people make a huge mistake in marriage on communication is they try to correct each other or they try to solve each other's problems when all they needed was venting. Just let some things out so they don't have to carry it with them. And unfortunately, people are so controlling that they want to give you solutions. Um, the other thing premarital is it, it helps you understand how to work together as a team, how to be successful. Those are called complementary relationships. That means you do this and I do that. And so there, they may be two different things, but people that do complementary relationships, they're able to, to dance through a marriage very well because they know what needs to be done when the other's doing something else. Also, it creates a deeper sense of uh, shared meaning. So marriage is more than owning a home, saving for retirement, having your children, uh, marking things off your to-do list before you die. It's, a, it's about being better together than you would be alone. You know, marriage is about making memories. And people that make memories together are able to carry their partner's life forward beyond their death. But people that don't make memories and do all the traditional human life without the soul and without the spirit involved, without the memories involved, their life dies on the vine when they die. You know, it's a huge tool, premarital counseling uh, it's been proven effective, and it's something that people really need to take serious in doing. If they don't want to go to counseling in the rest of their life, premarital counseling is probably one of the best investments you will ever, ever make in yourself and in your partner. So we're going to talk about uh, premarital counseling, you know, the, where it can really help. You know, creating positive marriage resolutions. It's easy to get emotional when, when you're discussing heavy-duty topics like money, sex, kids. But, you know, if you get an experienced counselor, they can help guide the conversation and prevent you and your partner from going off on some weird tangent. They just kind of can focus things back in on where the conflicts really, really are. Uh, sex is a huge topic with lots of expectations and marriage sex can be one of the most boring sense of sex there is or it can be one of the most exciting depending on how deep your relationship and your commitment to each other is. Um, some of the other tools is, is learning or improving uh, uh, resolution skills. It's important to end an argument and to be able to finish it. Uh, people that don't finish and just walk off. Uh, they have a sense of emptiness, and the fact is they have a sense of emptiness about their marriage. And so that's something that we are able to get in, in the middle of when we're doing premarital. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to talk about more benefits of the counseling, but, but then we're going to start talking about even deeper, you know, uh, careers, finances, intimacy. And then we're going to talk about some questions you could be asking each other. So come back. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. All right, we're talking about premarital counseling before you sign that contract. And I got to tell you, you know, uh, you know that the majority of all people, if not all people, have had huge blowouts in the past. I mean, really, both of you are going to know how to react during arguments, whether it's wielding a silent treatment or pouting, yelling, name calling, or all of the, the above. So if, if you're honest with yourself, there's probably room for improvement. And so le learning how to listen, learning how to communicate more effectively, more specifically, then you also, you know, it tells you what to say and what not to say in order to reach a happy solution. You know, another thing is secrets. A lot of people are stupid and they offer up before while they're in the honeymoon phase and they think they're all completely invincible they start to talk about their past and they start to share little things and then over time they don't talk about it for a little while and that person uh, 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 creeps up to marriage and all of a sudden they start bringing those old stories up of what you used to do but they don't remember them the same they remember in the way they want to remember them and so things get really warped 
And dealing with the past is another part of premarital counseling. Uh, quite frankly, uh, and this is just my opinion, healthy is people who anything prior to their marriage, unless it affects the relationship and unless it affects their commitment to each other, unless it's got some intrusive factor uh, involved in it, then those memories belong in the past. Uh, your memories sh together should be when you commit to each other. I'm not talking about when you're dating. I'm talking about when you decided to commit to each other. At that point, that's when all bets are off and all honesty takes place about your time with them and the future. And I'm not saying hold back everything from the past. What I am saying is hold back the things that don't belong in your future and that will have no impact on your relationship whatsoever. You know, also timing. A lot of people screw up timing. You know, they when to have kids, when to buy a house, when to go in debt, you know, when to when to make big choices, when do we have enough money to travel? Uh, uh, some people are very conservative with their views on that, and some people are very liberal with their views on that. And so that's something people have to get it together. Uh, timing on those big life choices is a huge thing that needs to take place. Also, toxic resentments. You know, you got to clear the air about resentments you've been hanging on to throughout your relationship. And, and boy, we build resentments up fast. You know, a, a counselor can help you resolve those issues and free yourself from them. Um, you know, it's called reflective listening, but also it's called reframing where you're able to help understand because people that are holding resentments, they have no empathy whatsoever. You are the devil. You are the enemy. I'm going to treat you as such when this topic comes up or I'm going to bring it up every time I'm mad at you. And every time something reminds you of my resentment for you, I'm going to treat you that way. And so people really abuse the heck out of each other when they're married or when they're dating. Uh, when they're when they're engaged because they hold those resentments and you have got to get rid of that crap. You are married. You need to treat your partner with the respect you would treat yourself. And that's hard for people to understand, but you have to do that. It doesn't mean you don't have arguments, but you end them. You learn how to end them and move on. Um, and that doesn't mean you end them without a solution. It means you end them as two adults compromising and then following that contractual agreement of what you're going to do going forward to prevent a negative outcome. Also, uh, you also want to dismantle fears about marriage. You know, one or both of you might come from a divorced family, dysfunctional background where fighting, manipulation was normal. So premarital counseling can teach you how to make peace with your past and, and break that cycle. And I'll talk to you right now about the word forgiveness. You know, people can go to church for a thousand years and never learn how to forgive, unfortunately. Uh, but the deal is, is that, or, or any religion, by the way, um, here's the deal. If you want to forgive someone, stop attacking the thing that you're so upset about and start inquiring about the process that led to the bad choice. That's the land of forgiveness. It's not about beating the other person down for the dumb thing that they did because, uh, believe me, throughout the course of life, no matter how old you are, we all make stupid choices and do dumb things, not thought out, impulsive, stupid, reckless, consequential to lots of other people. These things happen in life. And so how you deal with that in marriage is you challenge the process that led to the choice rather than the choice. So that means that we stop asking the why question to each other and we ask what and how. What made you decide to do that? How did you decide that this was the way to go? What kind of thoughts did you have before you decided to do this? That means you're willing to hear them, you're willing to understand, you're willing to possibly empathize, and you're willing. You're looking for forgiveness. So partners that look for forgiveness, they use what and how questions, never a why, because whys are motive-based, and if you ever want your children or anyone to lie to you, ask them a why question, and they usually will warp it into something because they know that you have an idea in your mind what you believe their motives were and it wasn't good. Uh, people that ask why questions uh, often get lied to and they don't understand why they are lied to. 
So if you want to you want to identify the seeds of, of future marital stress with an experienced outsider's perspective, that's what premarital counseling offers. Uh, it also addresses the money. Um, we're going to talk about that, uh, um, how to manage your schedules, how to get time together. Uh, it also unearths a lot of additional problems by identifying personalities and uh, per- person, even interestingly enough, uh, different personality disorders that can creep into the marriage. And it's also a way to learn how to be humble and, and how to understand humbleness. Because uh, when people get married, uh, you know, what's great about dating if you don't live together is you don't have to always smell the bad breath. Uh, you don't have the body smells. You don't have to go into the bathroom sometimes. You don't, you're not as uh, uh, exposed to all those things that you are exposed to, uh, you know, farting in the middle of the night or whatever people do. It's the crazy stuff. But, you know, that that stuff's not sexy. And so it's real hard to get sexy out of those discoveries that we all of a sudden uh, uh, discover uh, each other has. And so uh, those things can be uh, very frustrating. The other thing is learning gratitude. Uh, People that are grateful for each other are going to last a lot longer than people that aren't. And uh, the other thing is you get complete privacy. That means there's confidentiality. Things don't leave the room. Uh, and, and you're able to, to really uh, get things, your concerns out on the table without anybody knowing about it in your life, which is a good thing. The, uh, you know, in premarital counseling, one of the big things is, is understanding what your career goals are. You know, are you going to get a second job? Are you going to travel more? Are you going to get more education? Uh, you know, and, and what's it going to take uh, to be together in that scenario? You know, do you, do you ever plan to change careers? And if so, how how will you adjust your lifestyle and your budget to allow for lower household income? Uh, during busy times, it, some people are workaholics and they work late at night or on weekends or during vacations. How's that going to be navigated? Uh, and so, you know, a sense of finances, you know, asking each other, you know, what is our current financial situation, including our total debt, savings, retirement funds? I'm telling you, folks, in this day and age, you need to get a medical evaluation of your partner. You need to get a complete financial breakdown, including credit check. And uh, you really, you really want to understand uh, any criminal behavior that your partner has ever had. These are huge things, and I know it sounds stupid, but uh, people hide behind their personalities. A lot of people are too busy to really get to know the person that they meet. And I always say, you never know who you married till you divorce them. Um, you know, but the, the the deal is is that what you really are going to need to understand is that you, are you safe with the person or do they have a background do how are, how have they handled their finances in the past what you know what is their medical situation do they have any disorders diseases that i need to learn about and i'm not saying they're all sexual diseases i'm saying everything because dang you know in the future you, you might have to be the one picking up the slack for that person you may be the one having to pay off all their bills you may be the one having to pay off their school loans. You may be the one having to deal with their medical issues uh, and having insurance at all times, which can be very stressful for people and because it's expensive. Um, and so, you know, darn, these are things that got to be talked about. How are we going to navigate through those kind of waters? You know, uh, do we have an emergency fund? I, I can tell you. You know, if you're going to live like you're in a third world country and live paycheck to paycheck, if not day to day, uh, day-to-day people are stressed out because they don't know what's coming tomorrow. People that don't have money in the bank are stressed out um, because they have to reinvent the wheel every single day of their lives. P- couples that save money, like three months worth of salary, they think entirely different. They operate entirely different simply because they know they've got an emergency fund if anything bad happens and they're proud of themselves for being able to save and have that fund and now they don't have to function on uh, fight or flight all the time. They can actually look at each other as human beings because they're relatively financially safe, which is our form of survival. 
Um, so finance is huge, you know. Used to be we could go out and hunt in the woods and go get your dinner, but nowadays we go to the grocery store and you got to pay for it. So the deal is that's a serious talk that people have to have. You know, another thing is intimacy. You know, are we really happy with our current lovemaking? Uh, are we happy with our schedule? Do either of us want more? Are we too shy to talk about it? Uh, are there things that we would like to have that we don't have? Um, you know, uh, it's interesting that once people get into a groove with sex, they feel safe because that's how they have sex. But the deal is that, that we ha- we need more. We need the soul to be in there. We need the spirit to be in there. And we need people to be wanting to connect on that level also. If you're going to grow a marital sex life, you got to grow it based on your friendship, your respect for each other, your souls, your, your spirit, and your freedom of communication to say anything to each other and be able to hold that within the marriage. It, it's very important for people to do that. The other thing is uh, people that touch each other, uh, you know, that's amazing thing. We have this energy space, each of us, and that space is usually about two to three feet, and, and depending on how stressed out people are. But, but the deal is that space belongs to your marital partner. That means they're the one that can enter there. I'm not saying your kids can't, but, but they're the one that, that really should be entering that space. And people that don't enter that space with each other and don't hold hands for a second or touch for a second or kiss or, or hug, just it, 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 I'm talking 20 seconds in a day, 20 times in a day. If you could just do that with each other, you develop a higher sense of intimacy because we consistently remind each other that we belong to each other. And that's a huge thing, especially if you want to do conflict resolution. The people that end up being roommates with uh, once a year sex uh, are people that don't enter that space. They don't have that intimacy. Uh, And so it's huge to understand how to build that intimacy within a marriage because sex gets old. No matter how sexy the other person is, it gets old, uh, especially when it's the same old thing every time you do it. Uh, And so intimacy is a way we express each other. And it's a huge, you know, it's a huge part of marriage. And and so it's uh, learning how to have romance, meaning have pre uh, uh, pre sex and then then you know, uh, sex. And then after the sex, it can't just be pump, 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 and you're done. You know, there needs to be caressing. There needs to be kissing, hugging, romantic dinners. And I'm not saying get it all cushy and gushy and, you know, stupid. But what I am saying is you need to make sure that, that you respect each other, love each other, communicate well, and want to be together. It's really hard to have sex make love with somebody that you have deep resentments for. People usually carry their resentments into the bedroom and then they turn up dry and crusty or go and have an affairs and 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 they don't usually are not taking care of themselves. They're just uh, they're depressed. They feel less than that's what happens when people starve on the sex stuff. And so the deal is people really need to understand how important that is if you're going to ma- enter the institution of marriage. You know, marriage can be the loneliest place in the world uh, when it's not working. And many people will go years, years, never having that real intimacy with each other, never having that connection and just being roommates because it's safer, because we have the kids, whatever the excuses are. You know, you can be married to anybody if you're willing to accept who they are. You don't marry somebody to change them. A lot of people are control freaks, they're manipulative, and they do want to change their partner, all the things they don't like about them. That's not a way to go about marriage. That is disrespectful, and it's a horrible thing to try to do to your partner. Your job, if you want peace in your life, is to learn how to adapt to your partner's communication and influence them with your preferences. I prefer that we did this. I'm not saying we have to, but I would like. That means you can put your stuff to get out forward so people can hear it, understand it, but you're not uh, expecting them to follow you. And that's where resentments come in. You know, religion, another huge thing. Some people have really deep religious beliefs. Others have resentments. Others are agnostic. Others are atheist. Others, you know, people in this world are very complex when it comes to the idea of religion. Do you want to go to a church with doctrine or do you want to go to a church that's Bible-based? You know, 
I, for one, don't like doctrine. I think most churches these days are going more towards, at least from a Christian perspective in the United States, going more towards a universal type of approach. And by the way, what's interesting is Catholic means universal, <laughs> but Catholic is doctrine. And I'm a Catholic. I, I baptize a Catholic. I'm not a practicing Catholic, but I got to tell you that, you know, doctrine is man-made. The Bible is the Bible. And the Bible has a lot more sense of interpretation for a lot greater mass of people uh, than doctrine. That's just my two cents. Doesn't mean it's right. All right. Now, uh, if you come from different spiritual beliefs or practices or your families are entrenched in different beliefs or practices, you're going to have to learn how to integrate, you know, enter those things. What's interesting from a Christian perspective is Christian values pretty much follow the same values of about every religion there is in the world. And so that value system is not foreign to anybody. The other thing that really gets people honked off is household duties. Who will be responsible for household chores? You know, when you marry a partner that basically has uh, lives like a teenager, uh, you know, leaves a trail everywhere they go, that can be extremely frustrating. And a lot of arguments take place over the presumption that one partner has to do everything. Not a good thing. I don't, you know, vacuum or I don't. Well, if you're going to be married, you better learn how to do it. Once again, you got to put your humble hat on and deal with it. All right, we're going to talk about a little more about family involvement, social life, and the kind of talks you want to have when you're married and when you are preparing to be married. So come back. Welcome back, everybody. All right, we're talking about premarital counseling and uh, what you need to know before you sign that contract. All right, so counseling, you know, Another argument issue is family involvement. You know, how often are the parents going to visit on a regular basis or the family going to visit every weekend, once in a while? What are those expectations? And I got to tell you, uh, the truth is, even though we're a mixed uh, melting pot culture here, uh, it's quite frankly, uh, it, it's interesting that people coming from different cultures, depending on what generation they are from that culture, uh, have different ideas on family involvement. Uh, so many times a, a first or second generation Hispanic family is going to be like totally together every weekend, all the time they can. That's the expectation. Uh, you know, it, it, there's closed families like a Jewish culture is a closed family unit. Uh, many times, I'm not saying all of them. It's just tr traditionally, uh, it's more of a closed family. You know, are are they uh, an open family, open and willing to take anybody of any age, of any any creed or culture or color or whatever? You know, are, are there prejudiced people in the family? Are there people we need to avoid? Are there people drug issues, alcohol issues? These are things that need to be talked about. Uh, dividing the holidays is a huge part of of learning what to do to create those new traditions. How do you deal with your, your respective drama from your families? How involved do we get? Do we spend money? Do we not spend money? Do we deal with it? Are we the negotiators? Are we the person to, to mediate? You know, that's something that we really have to talk about before we get into it. The other thing is, how close are you with your parents? Are you going to have a talk with me and then go talk with your parent, change your mind, and then I'm the bad guy? And you made the compromise with me. So that's it's kind of like a lot of that. You hear a lot of that in counseling. And it can be very frustrating for both partners uh, because they're so used to consulting with their parents that they don't understand that they're in a marriage. And now they have to consult each other. It's not that you don't get other people's opinions, but you guys have to land on a compromise. You don't go out and renegotiate after you made a deal. That's kind of stupid. It's good to have more insight and to offer that information, but to offer that as a way to go, crazy. All right. Now, how often are you going to go on vacation with your families? Are you going to go to your families on vacations? You know, it's not something one of us loves to do sometimes. So how can we compromise? You know, uh, can we leave three days ahead and, and, and instead of staying the whole week? Can we go somewhere else and tag on to the vacations to where we see the family, but we're not there the whole time? You know, that stuff you got to negotiate the expectations on a little bit or the preferences. The other thing is social life. You know, there's introverts and extroverts. Introverts get their energy from being alone. They want, they want to be sitting in front of the TV for 20 hours. 
uh, with their beer or whatever, doing their thing because they're introverts and they, they, it costs a lot of energy for them to have to deal with people. The other part of it is the extrovert. The extrovert gets their energy from people. So they want to have those conversations. They want to meet all these people and they wonder why you're such a dud. And now you have guilt and shame because you're sitting at home and when the other person's having guilt and shame because they're out uh, with their friends all the time and you don't have time together. So that's stuff that people have to weigh. How are they going to uh, uh, do their social life along with their married life? Is that to be together? Is that to be apart? Are you going to respect each other's individuality? You know, if if a friend asks to stay at the house, how's that going to be negotiated? How often are you going to have date nights? Are you going to have vacations together with other friends? You know, these are things that people need to talk about before they get married. It's not that you're going to be absolute every single time, but these are scenarios that people seriously have to work through. These are not bombs you want to drop on each other at the last minute. Uh, death. Also, you know, how do how do you deal with death? How how has that been in the past? Have you ever had a major death? Because I will tell you, people that have lost someone close to them, a mother, a father, a, a, a sibling. They have a different idea of how to deal with death than the person who's never had a major death in their life. That's something that people have to talk about and go through and understand uh, and learn from each other. You know, you, it, this is what's amazing. You know, before romantic love, and this is probably uh, 1700s and back, um, and, and maybe even in the 1800s, in some cultures around the world, and we have a worldwide audience, marriage was based on talk because it was a contractual binding of individuals, properties, and family. And marriage is still a contract, as anyone who's ever gone through a divorce knows. So, you know, our focus is kind of weird on romantic love as the basis for marriage, and it has a big downside, though it makes for a pretty picture in the beginning. You know, what's not to like about the guy, you know, who who uh, who uh, did the a proposal and up in a, you know, diving from a, a, an airplane in a parachute or nestled engagement ring atop of a, 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 a cupcake or something like that. You know, who do, who doesn't love love stories of friends who hung out for years and then out of the blue realized love was in the air? Many of the conversations we need to have with our uh, future partner are avoided precisely because they're so unromantic. But these talks involve subjects that can reveal huge chinks in a relationship, you know, which romantic love enables us to look away from. Even though the failure rate of marriage is, is up in the 60s, it is well known uh, that it doesn't apply to us because our, our it, it, it's not because we fell out of love. I, I mean, it's not because we loved each other well enough. It's because we didn't trust each other. And people jack that up. You got the whole thing going down the tubes. And the minute people start throwing divorce at each other, that's when the other partner starts navigating what's life going to be like without you. So the intimacy in the relationship begins to pare down after that word's been brought up. You know, uh, uh, the complexity of marriage has a lot of research. You know, people tout living together first as a good trial run to see how marriage might go. But, and, uh, and a lot of people believe this, especially back in the 70s But as it turns out, and, and the 80s. But as it turns out, living together is a lousy idea because um, a lot of this research shows that they tend to slide into marriage as a logical next step instead of consciously, deliberately going about the idea of what will we be like when, it, when they're married. So now they have the normal, which is what they did before they were committed to each other in a living together scenario. But that living scenario really does not take into account the binding that is required and the commitment that is required to marriage. Marriage is a will or won't proposition. You're either going to do it or you're not going to do it. It's not a try. People that try have back doors. Marriage is a contract. No back door. If you take the back door, there's huge consequences, especially for everybody that has to be involved in your life uh, at dealing with the fact that you're getting divorced and they thought you guys were such a wonderful couple. You know, the kids thinking you're such a wonderful and now and all of a sudden you turn, turn out to be little turds and, mm -hmm. and you know, can't, can't do the hard things in life like fix things. You know, it's unfortunate, but I call it job security as a counselor. All right. 
how you argue. Well, it's not whether you argue, but how you argue that matters. So the whole body of research that, that's been done around this, being conscious and aware of the patterns in your arguments is very important uh, because you need to pay attention. If one, one of the really toxic patterns is present, that means we take a timeout. That means if you're going to take a timeout, you have to call a time back. You can't just go, okay, I don't want to talk about this, and then walk off. That's called a little child. Little children don't do marriage very well. So what we have to be able to do is go, look, this is not working out. We're not arguing like adults. We're doing all this yelling at each other. We're going to do some bad, say bad things because we're not listening to each other. Let's take a time out. And that means one minute for every year of your combined life. So each of you, if you're 30 years old, take a 30-minute time out and make sure you call the time out, you come back, and you deal with it. This is a technique. And, and it sounds stupid, but I got to tell you, the older we get, the more resentments we have and the angrier we are. It takes longer to calm down, believe me. Um, you know, the problem with the pattern is the escalation is built into it, and it needs time to de-escalate. And that's why the timeout is a very important thing. So once again, if you think about every movie that you ever saw, the lines you're going to remember are flat and straight. Flat and straight. They don't have any verbosity. They're just st And that means you're forcing people to listen to your words rather than going batshit crazy. Okay. Now, you know, behaviors bound to bring your marriage down are, are very specific. Criticism, attacking someone on the basis of their personality or their character rather than a specific behavior, contempt. I can always tell when people are about ready for divorce, you know, the opposite of love is not hate. As actually, in counseling, I like it when people hate each other and they're calling each other names because they're spending so much energy hating each other that they have to love each other to provide that energy. When people are at apathy, that's when you're almost at the end. Apathy is the most dangerous emotion. It is the opposite of love, and it can be a very destructive uh, emotion for people to have. Also, uh, consciously intending to abuse or insult your partner uh, defensiveness. People are always correcting each other over what happened and how it happened and all the semantics and they get involved in all that crap and the minutia of what their truth is and they're not willing to hear the perception of the other person. You know, if you're going to be married, you, I don't care if the person is crazy, let them say what they need to say and just validate them. Okay, I understand you, you think this about me and I feel sorry. I'm sorry you believe that. You know, let them vent. Let them do their thing. Let them say whether that that's their truth. They're entitled to it. Your job is to listen to it. You don't have to answer it. You don't have to correct it. You don't have to do anything. Stop being weird and defensive and start to listen. The listener is the most powerful person in any conversation. How you understand personality is also a huge part of this. You know, every marriage goes through stress and periods when, when one person's needs or goals change and the other person wants to, to grow in ways that, that one doesn't. So one person doesn't like change, the other person likes change. Well, guess what? Life is change. So if you're going to do marriage, you have to learn how to evolve together. And that's that complementary relationship where maybe somebody goes back to school and the other person has to carry the financial load. Or maybe there's some babysitting things that have to happen or taking care of the house or chores that have to, to switch. We have to be flexible if we're going to be married. That's huge. And you have to embrace change if you're married. Don't get in a rut and stay in a rut. Shake it up and do healthy. And that means find your passions and follow them. And your passions should be something about helping other people and being an expert at helping other people in some way that you're passionate about. The other thing that's talked about is, is uh, and it's huge, is your ideas about what a partnership looks like. Some people think partnership means we live together, we do things together, and then we, we go off into the sunset. Other people are weird and they want to be around you and, and, and hover all the time. They want to be with you at every moment. They want all that stuff. And I'm telling you, both ways can be destructive. You got to find something in the middle. The other thing is your expectation of how to raise children. That's a huge one. You know, when to go to counseling, here's the cues. You repeatedly have the same arguments. You feel an imbalance of responsibilities. You have a hard time expressing your emotions. You've gone through a traumatic event 
or something just feels off. These are the big, 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 big indicators of what we need to uh, go to counseling and when something is beyond uh, us. I hope this is helpful. Uh, that's our show. 